And what is up, everybody? Today, we are talking about the opt-out fallout. We're going to look at, from a fantasy perspective, take a look at some of the players that opted out and see what it means for possibly their backups or themselves, figuring out what we should do before our fantasy football drafts, figure out who we should draft and who we should avoid. We'll get into all of it today. But as always, be sure to like this video, share this video on social media, and subscribe. And if you have any questions or comments about football, fantasy football, anything like that, be sure to put it in the comment section, and I will answer it on the next football video. We're going to start answering questions at the end of the video, so we'll get into questions at the end of the video today, and we'll do that in the next few videos as well. So let's get right into this. We're going to start off with one player who opted out, not a huge name, but I'm going to start off with a former Michigan Wolverine, guy who had a nice college career. Actually, hasn't had a horrible NFL career. Had several good years with the Carolina Panthers, um, but just hasn't really uh, been able to stay on the field the past couple years, and that is Devin Funchess. He opted out of the season, I believe it was last week. Um, the Packers were already thin at wide receiver. Okay, They have Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Equinemius St. Brown, Alan Lazard. Um, I still think they have Jake Kumaro. And that's it. They lost Geronimo Allison, who also opted out uh, to the Detroit Lions. He's signed with the Lions this offseason. He also opted out. Uh, but the Packers are extremely, extremely thin at wide receiver already. This only makes it worse. But from a fantasy perspective, I've been talking to you guys about Alan Lazard for a while as a guy that you should consider in the later rounds. I think this only cements himself as the Packers' number two receiver and a wide receiver three, potentially, maybe even a wide receiver two by the end of the year, depending on how many targets he gets, uh, in fantasy football. I truly believe that he can be a good flex option for you on any given week. I want to share this stat with you. And I was reading an article, I believe it was on Packers Wire, uh, the Packers USA Today site. And Alan Lazard, when he was thrown to in 2019, he led the Green Bay wide receivers and passer rating when he was thrown to. The passer rating, when Aaron Rodgers targeted him, he had a 117.9 passer rating. And that was higher than Devonta Adams, who I believe was like, I want to say it was around 110-ish, which was still obviously good. But he actually had a, Rodgers actually had a higher passer rating when he was targeting Lazard than he was Devontae Adams. And we saw Rodgers earlier, I believe it was back in May, he called Lazard a budding star for that offense. Um, he seems to be really excited to work with Alan Lazard. And obviously the coaching staff must see something there because they didn't draft a wide receiver in one of the r richest wide receiver drafts in NFL history. Um... So, I, obviously, they see something in Alan Lazard, uh, but I like this even more now, especially as a late-round pick. If you're in 10-team leagues, I think in that 13th round range uh, is that a nice area that you can grab him. Uh, I believe Fantasy Football Calculator has him in that range. Uh, but... Really, especially in extended leagues, he's going really late on NFL.com, Yahoo, any of them. I don't see him getting drafted. Most of those rankings have him 170, 180, sometimes even lower than that. I think that is extremely low when you're getting a guy who very well could be, probably not even a stretch to say that he could be a top 100 player for sure in 2020 if you're going by just overall rankings. So I think that you can get Alan Lazard at the end of your drafts, unless you're in like 14, 16 team leagues, uh, you can probably grab him right at the end of your draft. And I think you're getting yourself a steal. Another player that uh, opted out, we're going to go to the defensive side of the ball. I actually have two here from New England. That's Dante Hightower and Patrick Chung. You may wonder, how is this, what does this have to do with fantasy football? Well, obviously, New England's defense was a defense that many were taking as a top five fantasy defense. I don't think there's any way you can do that anymore. Possibly top ten, but I wouldn't. I may not even take them top ten. I would take the Buccaneers before them. I would probably take the Chiefs before them. And I'm, I honestly would even consider taking the Browns right now before them with all the pieces they've added, and they have a nice young secondary. I think New England secondary is still going to be good, even though they don't have Patrick Chung. Uh, they uh, still have J.C. Jackson, um, still have Stephon Gilmore, still have a good group of corners on the outside, um, but they did lose safety depth with Chung, and the linebackers I don't think are going to be that good. They already lost Kyle Van Noy and Jamie Collins this offseason, and now they lose Dante Hightower. Chase Winovich, I think, is ready to have a really good year. 
is a pass rusher on the outside as an outside linebacker, but he's not going to be able to replace all three. And I think they've become really thin there. I really think this hurts New England. Keem also loses uh, his offensive tackle, Marcus Keenan. Uh, he also opted out. New England hit, got hit really hard with the opt-outs. I know they had at least six players that opted out. So I would say avoid New England's defense unless it's outside the top 10 defenses and you're waiting until the end of the drafts, which they're probably not going to be there at that point anyways. So I think there are better options in the world of fantasy defenses than New England right now, so I would go in a different direction. Marquise Goodwin. Now this was another one that kind of... You can look at it from two different angles. You can look at it kind of like Devin Funches. He probably wasn't going to do a whole lot in fantasy land anyways. But you can also look at it that other players will see an increased role because of it. Goodwin was going to be a nice veteran presence there. Uh, it was going to be kind of a insurance blanket for Deshaun Jackson so they wouldn't have to force Jalen Rigger to come in year one and really produce. Well, now I I still would not take Jalen Rigger. Honestly, I wouldn't take Deshaun Jackson either. Um, unless it's like the last round of your draft. But now, I think if you're in 12 or 14 team leagues, or if you're in a league with an extended bench, and you're looking, you know, 17th, 18th round in a 10-team league, so you're looking about pick 170, 180, that's where I think you can take Jalen Rager. Because I think he is going to see the field now. I don't know what he's going to be like. Wasn't a huge fan of him coming out of TCU. If you go back to my NFL draft uh, videos or my articles at Behind the Steel Curtain, uh, dot com slash fan posts, you will see that I was not a huge Rager fan. He dropped balls in college, and he couldn't separate late in the route downfield. He has the speed, but he wasn't gaining that separation you would think he would be able to gain with his speed. Now, part of that... Part of his problems could have been because of quarterback play. His production wasn't as good as we thought it would be. But we'll see what happens in New England, in not New England, Philadelphia. We'll see what happens there. But I think the loss of Marquise Goodwin gives him a little bit bigger role year one. Now, this is the biggest one, probably. Damian Williams. Okay, now a lot of people were really high on Damian Williams. Um, and... I, I wasn't as much because of Clyde Edwards Healer being drafted in the first round. I know that uh, Andy Reid was talking him up a whole lot. Uh, was also uh, Patrick Mahomes was the one who apparently wanted to draft Clyde Edwards Healer. Personally, in the draft, I was kind of shocked to see the pick because I figured if they take a running back, it'd be DeAndre Swift. Could you imagine DeAndre Swift in that offense? That would be super explosive. Um, Edwards Healer isn't quite that explosive. He's not super fast. Not. Terribly shifty, uh, but he was productive his last year at LSU. Um, I, I plus Kansas City in that offense, he's going to have open running lanes. They can't stuff the back box against Patrick Mahomes, and he'll probably get a lot of chances in the red zone. So we'll get into his draft stock in a minute. But obviously, the loss of Damian Williams. If you already had a draft and you took him, maybe a guy that you'll want to consider picking up right now would be Antonio Gibson because Darius Geis just got released by the Washington football team. Almost said Redskins. I uh, don't want to offend anyone. Um, but I really, I, I, that's one guy that I think you pick up, Adrian Peterson. If you're in non-PPR leagues, you may want to pick him up over Antonio Gibson. Uh, but the loss of Damian Williams will hurt the depth on your team. But from the impact that this makes... Is Clyde Edwards Healer? His draft stock is skyrocketing. Look at this from according to RotoWire. Before Damian Williams uh, decided to opt out, his ADP was twenty five point six. Okay, that's not that's fairly reasonable, even though he is a rookie. Now his ADP since that time is seven point eight. Okay, now I, I get that this is a great offense. We remember what happened to Kareem Hunt when he came in after Spencer Ware went down with the injury. I mean, excuse me. I mean, look, it, I was watching another, I believe it was the Fantasy Headliners. They do a really good job, really begun to really like their product. Uh, they really do a good job breaking down fantasy football. You can go and check them out. Uh, you can also check them out on YouTube. But... If I'm going to take a running back, any running back, or of any position, whatever my first round pick is, they have to be a cornerstone of my team. I'm expecting top end production from them most weeks. Well, we've talked about, we beat to death the discussion of the rookies in shortened off seasons, okay? 
I have a feeling they're going to start off slow. Now, I'm not saying he will, and maybe having this explosive offense will help Clyde edwards there along, and I'm not saying he won't have a terrific year. But you want to have something proven. It, it, and I, I want to go back just even a couple of years ago. And so if you look at Ezekiel Elliott, um, it, when he was taken, you know, with the top 10 pick in the draft. Okay, if you're looking overall, Ezekiel Elliott was much higher touted coming out of college than Clyde edwards Teeler was. And... Dallas had a way better offensive line than than Kansas City does, especially since that uh, Duvernay Tardif uh, guy, the guard for Kansas City, opted out. So the offensive line's not going to be as good either for Kansas City. But back to the point, if you look at Ezekiel Elliott, some people were taking him in the first round, some were taking him in the second round. Of course, he ends up having a fantastic year. But Clyde Rutiler's stock's going higher than that. I get that the offense overall may be better, but Elliott had the best offensive line of the decade in the entire NFL that he was playing behind, and he still wasn't being taken then. Go to Saquon Barkley. He was being drafted at the end of the second round his rookie year. And again, he had an excellent rookie year. But uh, Saquon Barkley was being compared to, you know, Barry Sanders and all these excellent running backs coming out. And I know that uh, Clyde Edwards has been uh, compared to David Westbrook or whoever, a former good running back that Andy Reid had for a while, I believe, in Philadelphia. Uh, but if you're looking at, you know, would I rather take a rookie Saquon Barkley or Clyde edwards Sealer? Ezekiel Elliott or Clyde edwards Sealer? And if I'm looking at that, I'm still looking at it from that point as well, because they're more proven now. But even back then when they were rookies, their draft stock should have been higher than Clyde edwards Sealer's is now. I sh- I w- especially in an offseason that is as short and odd as this one, there is no way I should be taking Clyde edwards Sealer with my first round pick. And I don't think you should as well. In the second round, if you're in 12 and to 14 team leagues, yes, towards the back end, you can probably take them in the second round, maybe mid to late second round. But I don't, I still think that the, his original ADP is about where it should be, around 20 maybe. I think that's a fair ADP for a rookie in this offseason. I don't care, you know, what, you know, offense he's in. And so Clyde edwards Teeler, let's just be honest, he ran a 4-6 something 40, 40 at the combine. So he's not super fast. Um, he may get out, he may be sent out of the game on pass blocking downs if DeAndre Washington or Daryl Williams can get those up. And so he may honestly go out of the game because that was one of the things that he had seemed to struggle with um, towards the beginning of the year, when he, um, towards the end of the last year, excuse me. Um, it out. <coughs> at LSU, and there were times where he was better than some of the other running backs in this draft, but he's still really raw in that area. I expect Kansas State to work with him with that, but that will be interesting to see if he's taking out of the game in those situations. So I'm not taking Clyde edwards Taylor with my first-round pick. That is way too high. I know the offense looks good and stuff, but you cannot risk in a year like this with a rookie running back that was taken at the end of the first round, not a top-five pick like Saquon Barkley was, but just going by off of past history, don't take Clyde edwards Sealer with your first-round pick. You need something proven in your first-round pick. You can't win your league with your first-round pick, but you can lose it, okay? And, you know, I've had people tell me that before, and it's really true. Is You need to have something that's going to get you at least something, barring injury. Of course, we know injuries happen. But Clyde edwards Sealer, do not take him in the first round. Second round, if you're in extended leagues, yes. 10 team leagues, maybe right at the back end, the very far back end of the second. But more, I would prefer the third round, to be quite honest with you. I just don't think that he is worth what he's being, where he's being taken right now. The next one I want to get into are two receivers from Miami. That is Alan Hearns and Albert Wilson. Again, two guys that probably weren't going to make much of a fantasy impact. I had no plans on drafting either of them. But I really think this does help Preston Williams. And let's look at Fantasy Football Calculator for just a minute. You can see the graph there. Is ADP is around 145-ish right now. You see it's in that area. These are mostly for 12-team PPR or half PPR leagues. Now, I generally do non-PPR 10-team leagues. I'm in one this week. That's 18. We, we shrunk this year. Uh, hopefully, we can get back up to 10 next year. Uh, but if you're looking at that and stuff, you know... Is, it's a respectable ADP, but if you're looking at that, basing off of his projections, okay, NFL.com is projecting Williams to score 171 PPR points. That is, if that is the case, he should be going higher than that. 
Um, I I actually like that projection because there's they have very little depth there. Jakeen Grant is the other guy that could produce because of these opt outs. He's gonna probably get a lot of time in the slot with no Alan Hearns or Albert Wilson, but uh, I still don't think he's gonna provide much from a fantasy perspective unless you're in 14, 16 team leagues and you can afford to take him with your 20th round pick with you know your 200th pick you know maybe you can take him then but I'm not too concerned about him in fantasy land Preston Williams is the guy though that's going to see an increased target share this year we already knew he was going to but now he really is because he Ryan Fitzpatrick has Devontae Parker and Mike Gusecki that's it so Preston Williams is gonna be the number two wide receiver and I know he didn't run well he didn't test well at his pro day and stuff coming out of Colorado but this guy's talented he had a lot of talent coming out of high school he couldn't stay out of trouble uh, and of course, last year he, I believe, he tore his ACL or whatever, um, that ended his season. But before he ended the season, he had several nice games. I really do like Preston Williams in the later rounds this year. He's a guy that I think is going to come in big down the stretch this year, especially when they have some favorable matchups like <coughs> the New York Jets. Next one I want to get into is Michael Pierce from the Minnesota Vikings, formerly of the Baltimore Ravens who was signed to replace Linval Joseph. And we've talked about a lot about already how they lost their top three corners in Mackenzie Alexander, Trey Waynes, and Xavier Rhodes. They still have Mike Hughes there. Brought in a couple other nice pieces. Have some good safeties there still. Uh, but the defensive line, they still uh, have some holes there. I have questions on all three parts of the defense. So I would probably say avoid the Minnesota defense. I don't think they're going to be top 10 defense maybe not even top 15. If you take them in top 15, I can't argue with it, but I would not take them as one of the top 10 defenses because I do not see that happening. Marquise Lee, he uh, he was signed by the New England Patriots. We remember him back in Jacksonville, had some nice moments, uh, but had injury problems. He's opting out of the season, but Jacoby Myers is the guy that could uh, benefit from this. Okay, second year pro of NC State. He showed some nice flashes last year with Tom Brady. Of course, he's a different quarterback this year. Uh, but he actually showed some nice ability to win in the red zone, made some nice difficult catches despite his size. And, I mean, we know that we have Nikhil Harry, Julian Edelman there. There's nothing else that New England really has to offer at wide receiver. So I think this opens Jacoby Myers up for, a, one again, one of those, if you're 14, 16 team leagues, 14 team extended bench, 12 team super extended bench down to, you know, 18 players or more, at the end of your draft, you can grab Jacoby Myers and he may bring a tiny bit of upside because we never know who Cam Newton's going to show a liking to. He may like Jacoby Myers, may like Nikhil Harry, maybe it's Julian Edelman, we don't know. But I think that his target share will go up a little bit. He'll get enough looks. He'll probably get to be on the field for a good amount of time. So I think Jacoby Myers is a guy that you could consider taking if you're in extended leagues with extended benches. But in standard PPR or non-PPR leagues, I would still say avoid him. The last one is Geronimo Allison. Okay, this was former uh, receiver from the Packers. Uh, was signed by the Lions on a one-year $910,000 deal or something like that. Uh, I've, I like Geronimo Allison coming out of college, I believe back in 2016, uh, was a seventh-round pick or went undrafted, one or the other. But he was going to come in and probably compete with Danny Amendola for uh, get, gain some more time in the slot. Now, this will open up probably uh, a roster spot for either Chris Lacey or the second-year Travis Fulgham. Uh, th those guys will probably get a chance to make the roster instead. Quintez Cephas, rookie from Wisconsin, I think he'll probably end up making the roster. Um, but if, if you're looking at just from a fantasy perspective, I think this helps Danny Amendola more than anybody else. Um, because the, Allison was the only person who was going to really threaten Amendola from getting reps in the slot. And if you look at Danny Amendola's la numbers last year, I want to look at this. When Matthew Stafford was the quarterback, which was the first nine games of the year, he had 39 catches, 452 yards of touchdown, which totals up to 90.2 PPR points. That's 10 a game, not bad. And that was with Matthew Stafford. By the end of last year, he had nearly 100 targets. And I wouldn't be surprised if that number actually went up this year. Now, there's been talks that maybe if Tampa Bay has an injury to their to someone that plays out of the slot for them, that they may consider they may consider maybe at, uh, trading for Danny Amendola because apparently Amendola wanted to go and play wherever Tom Brady went to play. I don't know if that's still going to happen, but it's something to think about. But 
I believe Danny Amendola is a guy again in the same boat as Jacoby Myers. In the same boat as you know some of these other receivers that we talked about. Um, Jakeem Grant, maybe you can take him in extended leagues, but nothing else big outside of that. I don't think it's a world shaking thing that happened. Uh, so the big things from the opt out is that Alan Lazard should be drafted now in just about any league format, unless you're like a four or sixteen format. Um, Jalen Rieger can be drafted in extended formats, and then the Preston Williams should definitely be drafted, and his stock should be going up. And Clyde Edwards Healer. His stock's going to go up, but don't overhype the kid, okay? Again, shortened off season. Don't take him with your first-round pick. He's not a guarantee. You need to guarantee someone with your first-round pick. I would wait until the second, possibly even the third. Or don't forget to be sure to don't forget to like this video, share this video on social media, and subscribe to this channel. As I said, we were going to get into questions. We did have one person. I'm apologize. I don't have the username down here with me, uh, but it was on the ESPN video that I did uh, saying how he's not going to watch ESPN anymore. Anyways, they did not have hockey or NASCAR, and that is a good point. Uh, whoever it was that mentioned that, I, again, I apologize for not having the name with me, um, but thank you very much for commenting. Whoever put in that comment, feel free to comment here anytime. You're always welcome to. Uh, but yeah, I, ESPN has really, really gone downhill. Their ratings hit, I believe, an all-time low last month, and they're not getting any better. NBA ratings are lower than PGA Tour golf right now, um, and I'm glad about that. They can't keep the politics out of sports. They're pushing for no sports, people. Okay, There are people on ESPN that are hoping for no sports so they have more time to push their political views, and I'm not joking. They just sold their primetime programming to Woke. And as we're starting to hear, get woke, get broke. Because people don't want to hear politics mixed, mis, mixed up with their sports. And I'm not the only one who believes that. If you don't believe me, just look at the ratings that they have right now, and you'll see why. That's going to do it all for today. Thank you all for watching. We will get into some probably some more stock up, stock down in the next video. Uh, to continue to prepare you for your fantasy football drafts in the 2020 fantasy football season. That's going to do it all for today. Thank you all for watching. Have a good one.